Maryland football put everyone's doubts to rest against Big Ten powerhouse this weekend. Men's and women's basketball are heating up and field hockey season comes to a heartbreaking close. All that and more coming up on the left bench. It was all about what can I do better. They're getting rewarded for their hard work. Well, welcome in everyone to the Left Bench presented by Terrapin Sports Central. Kev McNulty and Kira Bruno joining you here for the final time in 2022. And boy, that's crazy to say out loud. But Kira, what did we witness in Uncasville, Connecticut this past weekend? Well, Kevin, it was absolute domination between against two solid opponents that no one expected to see this early in Kevin Willard's tenure as head coach. Yes, it was domination. Let's get right into it. Maryland completely crushed both St. Louis and Miami in the Basketball Hall of Fame tip-off tournament this past weekend. And we'll start off with that first matchup of the tournament against St. Louis. Dante Scott dropped a career-high 25 points on the Billikens, and Don Carey and Akeem Hart each poured in 16 points of their own. Defensively, Maryland caused 14 turnovers, capitalized on many of those opportunities. With both sides of the ball firing on all cylinders, Maryland scored a season-high 95 points in the win. Maryland shot a staggering 50% from the field, and that percentage only went up in the championship game against Miami on Sunday. Just like in round one, Carey had the hot hand against the Canes, and George, the Georgetown transfer hit four threes in both games. Scott and Juju Reese used their size and strength against a smaller Miami team, powering their way to a combined 41 points. Miami would get the Terp lead down to 10 points, but it was not enough. A 60% shooting day from the Terps led them to an 88-70 win over Miami in the Hall of Fame tip-off championship. Here's head coach Kevin Willard on his team's grand performance. Uh, we have unbelievably high character kids who want to win, and they understand what it takes to win, and they're bringing it every night, and they're, they're getting rewarded. Um, they're getting rewarded for their hard work and their, their effort they're putting in, and that's what, that's what matters to me. It's not just the men's team getting national attention so far this season. The number 19 women's basketball team balled out at number 17 Baylor this weekend, thanks to Diamond Miller's stellar performance. The first quarter was back and forth with defense being displayed on both sides of the ball. But come the second quarter, Maryland and Miller lit up the court. The Big Ten Player of the Week notched 12 points and went 6 of 8 from the field to help the Terps to a 36-26 lead at the half. She tallied a career-best 32 points and added 10 rebounds, putting on an absolute show. Come the third quarter, Baylor put up a fight, cutting the deficit to four with two minutes remaining. But it wasn't enough to stop Miller and the Terps, who came out on top 73-68. to And Kevin, I think this comes as a surprise to most Maryland fans how well both teams are doing this season with having a whole new coach and then for women's team having a new starting lineup too. Completely different, and Diamond Miller has really shown herself to be a leader now in her senior season. She's played remarkable one combined loss between the two, two teams to the defending national champion South Carolina Gamecocks on the women's side, of course, and I think they'll take it. That's a pretty solid start for both teams. Right, yeah. And, well, many student athletes enter college with their major undeclared. Others choose a major related to their sport or athletics in general. But that couldn't be further from the truth for one Maryland women's basketball player. Our Sam Jane has more. Maryland women's basketball freshman Bree McDaniel has impressed early on in this season. And head coach Brenda Fries has raved about the young freshman's performance. Again, it just speaks volumes of the jump that she's made in the last month and just how talented she is. We, we need that versatility. Bree McDaniel grew up on the west side of Chicago in a home that was surrounded by apartments and other houses, with the city skyline appearing just off in the distance. So when she tells people that she enjoys being on the farm and milking cows, people often look at her as if she's crazy. They wonder how I get into it. <laughs> like, they, they talk about me all the time. They be like, how do you want to work with farm animals? I was like, you have your thing, I have mine, so let me have mine, and you be okay, and I'll be okay with my, what I'm doing. McDaniel attended Kenwood Academy on Chicago's south side. 
Yet her love for farm animals emerged when she visited her family farm in Tennessee at a young age. It was like mind blowing because it was like, wow, I'm next to a cow. Oh, I'm feeding the cow. I'm feeding the horse. I never fed a horse. So it... Bree was, has never been a real morning person. Like she might get up, but she would be a little cranky in the morning. But on the farm, she was up, dressed and ready at 6 a.m. every time. McDaniel decommitted from Texas A&M giving Brenda Freeze a chance to land one of the top recruits in the country. One of the, one of the biggest side factors on, on Maryland was the fact that they have a farm literally in the middle of campus. Yes, yeah. yes I got to <laughs> touch some cows and stuff and talk to some horses. I felt great. <laughs> in fact, McDaniel wants to be a livestock veterinarian, which played a big role in deciding which school she would ultimately choose to attend. Uh, yeah, that was one of the main things because, like, one day the ball will stop, so it's like I have to have something that I can go back to and work on. McDaniel's so. schedule is packed to the brim. On Mondays, she works with cows at the Maryland farm. Then on Tuesdays, she's crafting her jump shot at practice. Her new home in College Park is everything she could have hoped for. I'm in another class at 3, so I have a little time to myself for like an hour to get some work done. And then I go over to my lab, got my overalls and stuff like that. It feels great to be here and having that support support system. For Terrapin Sports Central, I'm Sam Jane. Yeah, and Kira, as a Chicago native, I can confirm there are no farms anywhere near Kenwood Academy, but I mean, good for Bree pursuing her passions outside of basketball. Yeah, definitely. Well, Sam, thanks so much for sharing her story. And number two, Ohio State came to College Park this weekend, and with the way Maryland football had played in its previous two games, everyone is, was expecting a blowout, but it certainly didn't play out that way. The Buckeyes struck first with a 31-yard touchdown pass from C.J. Stroud to Travion Henderson, and it looked for a moment like the Buckeyes would replicate their 66-17 win over Maryland last year. But Talia Tungavailoa looked like his usual self, leading the Terps on back-to-back -back drives that ended with Chad Ryland field goals, and bringing them within a point going into the second. The first of Leah's two touchdowns were to C.J. Dupree uh, late in the second quarter, and Maryland actually had the lead at halftime. After Leah ran it five yards for Maryland's second TD of the day, Mike Loxley decided to go for two and make it a six-point game. And they got it. Ohio State responded with a 13-yard Dallin Hayden touchdown, but the extra point attempt was blocked and returned 80 yards by Jacorian Bennett, a three-point swing that set up a huge sequence on the ensuing drive. Where the Terps faced a fourth and goal from the one, and Leah's prayer to the back of the end zone was caught by Ja'Shawn Jones to keep Maryland alive. The Buckeyes milked a lot of the clock and added another field goal with 42 seconds left, giving Maryland one last chance down by six. And then, Tungavailoa fumbled as he was hit, and the Buckeyes survived another close call in College Park. And what I found out is a group of guys that have taken accountability, because it's my job to lead this thing, and, and it obviously starts with me, but for them to partner with me and say, you know what, coach, this ain't on you guys, it's on us. It's our job to go out and play the way we're capable of playing. And I saw guys challenging each other. I saw guys having tough conversations. There wasn't any finger pointing. And I've been around here to see the finger pointing and, oh, it's this, it's that. But it was all about what can I do better. Three Terps have accepted invites to the Reese's Senior Bowl in February. The game welcomes the nation's top seniors and graduating players and is the first stage in the NFL draft process. Ja'Korian Bennett, Jalen Duncan, and Chad Ryland have all earned their spots on the roster. Bennett is one of the best defensive backs in the Big Ten. In his career wearing the Maryland uniform, he's recorded 28 pass breakups, 4 interceptions, and 66 tackles. Duncan, Maryland's left tackle, is Talia Tungavailoa's biggest protector, and a key reason why the Terps boast the fourth-ranked passing offense in the conference. And Ryland transferred to Maryland this year, and he's quickly made the shell his home. Well, even though Maryland's record on the field has improved over the past two seasons, its record in the stands has not. An article in the Washington Post last week detailed the program's struggle to draw crowds at newly renamed CQ Stadium. Prior to this past weekend's game against Ohio State, Maryland's average announced attendance was just under 32,000 fans per game. Only Northwestern has posted lower attendance numbers this season in the Big Ten. The Post article also revealed that the actual attendance at each game is on average about 10,000 less than the announced attendance, which includes tickets that go unused. The announced attendance for the game at Ohio, against Ohio State was 41,969, while the actual attendance 
was not announced. And another team suffered a heartbreaking loss this weekend, and that was Maryland men's soccer, which dropped its match against 14th seeded Cornell 2-1, ending the Terps NCAA tournament run. Cornell was pretty dominant in the first half, but thanks to Nicholas Neumann's four amazing saves, he was able to keep the score tied at zero at the half. But midway through the second half, things started to get rocky for the Terps. Cornell struck two goals in the span of a few minutes. Then came Albi Andronico with a quick answer for the Terps, a huge strike from outside the box to bring his team within one. Maryland was able to keep up the offensive pressure in the final three minutes, but just couldn't get shots on target, ending the team's 2022 campaign. And as Kara mentioned, the loss to in Ithaca marked the end of Maryland's season. But once again, it was a year where the Terps brought home some championship hardware. Sasso Sarovsky's squad clinched the program's first Big Ten title in six years with a draw at Indiana on October 30th. It was Maryland's 24th regular season conference championship, dating back to its days in the ACC. The Terps finished with a 4-0-4 record in the conference, highlighted by big-time wins over Ohio State and Rutgers. Although Maryland stumbled down the stretch, the team only suffered four losses this year, tying its lowest total since 2016. And from the College Cup to the World Cup now, where only one former Terp will represent his nation in Qatar. Alex Gary is here to look at who will play on soccer's biggest stage and which big name Terp was left off their World Cup team. Alex? Hey guys, it was a little weird to wake up this morning with World Cup in November, but you can't deny World Cup fever is in the air, especially because we have a former Terp planning to Qatar. Maryland has been known to produce top level talent, but they haven't been known to translate that talent towards international play. Despite that fact, Dane St. Clair was named to the Canadian international squad earlier this year. St. Clair will join the small list of former Terps to represent their nation in the World Cup. He'll join Team Canada as their, one of their three goalkeepers. St. Clair is the first Terp to make the World Cup since Rodney Wallace represented Costa Rica in 2018. His nomination to the Canadian squad came with a little sp surprise, especially after his impressive 2022 season. St. Clair balled out for Minnesota United FC, earning a save percentage of 69.4% along with five clean sheets on the season. Those stats were enough to earn him a spot in the MLS All-Star Game, where he yet again proved his dominance, taking home the All-Star Game's MVP award. St. Clair is one of the most accomplished former Terp goalies, but another former Terp keeper just failed to make his national team's cut. Zach Steffen, who recently saw a historic rise to fame, was just short of making a United States squad for the 2022 World Cup. While many saw this as a surprise, Stefan's downfall has been brewing over the past couple seasons. Despite his impressive move to English powerhouse Manchester City, he underperformed in his role. Big mistakes like this blunder against Liverpool in the FA Cup semi-final led to a diminished role with the former Premier League winners. He was later loaned to Middlesbrough of England's second division, where he continued to struggle with injuries that kept him off the field. He played solid for the U.S. during international play, but his understudies Ethan Horvath and Matt Turner stole the spotlight. When Stefan went down in the injury in the CONCACAF Nation League final, Horvath became the nation's hero when he saved a late game penalty to propel the U.S. over Mexico. Turner also shined in his play with Arsenal, propelling Stefan down the U.S. depth charts even when he was available to play. All of these factors created tension in the U.S. goalkeeper room, tension that head coach Greg Berhalter thinks will be avoided with Stefan not on the squad. And guys, it's going to be a little weird to see the U.S. play with uh, Stefan not in goal. Yeah, it's going to be tough to see, but it's going to be exciting to see how Dane St. Clair will perform. Yeah, I guess we can root for Canada as well, as well as Team USA. I mean, a pretty decent showing on Monday against uh, Wales, so we'll see how far they can go. Thanks so much, Alex. Of course, guys. And keep it right here, because when we come back, we'll recap this weekend's volleyball and wrestling matches and break down the field hockey season with TSE's Michael House. There are so many rewards in life. You coming into our home was one of the greatest rewards we could have ever had. You know, it took 20 years, and I got my third child, who was 17 at the time. It's so cool to watch the adult that you've become, and you really have done as much for us as you think we've done for you.
world, I have a quick message. It's about safe driving. All right, let's go. Anytime you're driving, have the seatbelt buckle tight. Both hands on the wheel and your phone out of sight. We're not in your hand trying to text somebody back. Because if you do, your car might get smacked. The moral of the story, just put your phone down. The people on the road will stay safe and sound. Put your phone down, put your phone down. People on the road will stay safe and sound. Yeah. <laughs> Welcome back to the Left Bench, brought to you by Terrapin Sports Central. I'm Kevin McNulty, that's Kira Bruno, and Kira, we just talked about a Maryland team that suffered a crushing season-ending loss this weekend, but they weren't the only ones. Nope, and it was a familiar foe that did knock them out, too. It was deja vu for Maryland field hockey on Friday as its NCAA tournament run ended in the Final Four against Northwestern, just like its loss in the Big Ten tournament semis. It was all defense for both teams in the first three quarters with just a few shots on goal, but none made it in the net. And it wasn't until the fourth quarter when the game got even more dramatic. The Wildcats netted a goal quickly at the beginning of the frame, and then they did it again on an empty net with two minutes to play. The Terps got on the board quickly thereafter as an Emma Burdine shot cut the deficit in half. Maryland had the chance to tie the game twice more, but just couldn't get one behind the goalie. Even though the Terps outshot Northwestern 10-7, they couldn't advance to the championship and their season ended with a 2-1 loss. And to talk about Maryland season as a whole, we're excited to welcome in our very own Michael House, who covered the team all season long. Big Mike, thanks for being here. It's thanks for inviting me. So Mike, let's start off with the game on Friday against Northwestern. They knocked them out of the Big Ten tournament and now the NCAA tournament. So what do you think Maryland had to do there to kind of beat them in that? Well, I think you got to look at what the Wildcats did. And what they did is jump off to Lees in the two losses against Maryland. In both games that Maryland lost, they were facing a two-goal deficit in the second half. And that's hard to do against a team like Northwestern. They have a great goalkeeper in Annabelle Scubis, and they play great defensively. And like we saw, the Terps just couldn't can handle that. And then you also got to look at the offensive decline they faced through the second half of the season. They started off the season hot. They averaged 4.2 goals per game in their first 15 matches. But as time went on, that offensive production started to decline. You saw in their last six matches before the NCAA tournament game against Northwestern, they only averaged 2.2 goals per game. That's a sharp decline from how they started the season. And Mike, for a lot of programs, back-to-back -back trips to the Final Four would be an outstanding accomplishment. But for Maryland Field Hockey, which has won seven national titles under Missy Maharg, it's just uh, another year not winning one of those championships. They haven't won since 2011. But in your eyes, covering the team all year, would you consider the 2022 season a success? I think you got to call, call it kind of disappointing. You look at all the talent they had on this team. You had Hope Rose returning from a dominant freshman year. She won Big Ten Freshman of the Year that year. Um, and she was the third leading scorer in the Big Ten this year. You also look at the graduate transfers they brought in. Danny Van Rootslar and Leah Krause, they made immediate impacts for this team. Danny Van Rootslar, she was the second leading scorer for this Terps team. And Leah Krause, she had five game winning goals for the Terps. That was the most on the team. And then you look at the graduate transfers they had returning for their fifth season. You had B.B. Donrad and Riley Donnelly. Both made huge impacts for the team. So with all that talent, you got to call it a little bit disappointing for this Maryland team. Yeah, that's right. And coming into this year, they were ranked number two. But they couldn't pull off the championship for the Big Ten tournament or the NCAA tournament run. So looking at next year, what do you think Maryland has to do to achieve those goals? I mean, you got to look at their returning players first. Obviously, Hope Rose, she's going to return for her junior year, so she know, you know you're going to get that offensive production from her. And you got to look at the defense. you got key defensive players returning. You have Erica Morris-Adams, who won Big Ten Co-Freshman of the Year this year. She's going to return and play well. And then you also got Rain Wright, defender. She played a huge impact on this team this year. She's going to be returning for her senior season. And then look at their recruiting class. Missy Maharg, head coach, she's known as one of the best college recruiters in all of college sports. So you better believe she's going to bring in another talented group of freshmen to help lead this Terps team. Well, Mike, that's all we have for you. But thanks for coming on. And thanks for your hard work covering the team all season. Hey, thank you, guys. Well, you can find Michael on Twitter at Mike P. Howes. And after stunning number five Ohio State on Friday. Maryland Volleyball could not celebrate their seniors with a victory about 24 hours later. For the game, the Terps honored their four seniors, Raynell Jones, Lexi Finnerty, Jem Grimshaw, and Maddie Nauman. In set one, Maryland went in a 5-0 run to take an 18-11 lead. But Michigan would climb back, forcing set point at 24-23. The Terps fought off set point three different times on Anastasia Russ kills en route to a 
to 26 first set victory. The Wolverines jumped out to a 6-0 lead in set two, and Maryland managed to tie the set at 17 before going on a 9-2 run. Following a timeout, Michigan scored four straight points and took set two 25-22. And in the third set, Maryland held a 19-15 advantage, but the Wolverines went on a 7-1 scoring run to take a two-point lead. The Terps fought back to tie the set at 23. Michigan used a Matty Dowd kill to win the set 25-23. Maryland kept set four pretty close to start. Then the Wolverines went on a huge 15-1 run, powered by three Mirza kills, cruising to a 25-11 set four win to win the match. I think, uh, you know, we, we kind of got a good lead there in the first, and then I thought we did a good job standing tall and, and, and securing the first uh, set win. It was kind of back and forth, back and forth. I think both teams had two or three set points, and we had the close. I thought we had some chances in set, twos and, uh, set two and three, excuse me, and uh, you know, just missed out a few plays. I thought they played really hard. I mean, they covered a lot of balls, and they were able to turn some of the swings in transition to better swings than we could get. And and Kevin, we have to talk about that match against Ohio State on Friday. Huge upset for the Terps. They lost the first set, but then they won the next three to secure that. Yeah, they got it done and then couldn't get it done on Saturday. It just shows you how up and down the Big Ten is. But that was their second top ten win of the season. You know, Maryland's making strides like we talked about last week on In Focus. They just aren't going to be headed to the postseason. And the Terps will remain in College Park for their home finale on Wednesday against number 25 Purdue, who they beat on the road for their first top 10 win back in October. We'll see if Hughes' squad has a little magic left on Thanksgiving Eve. And Maryland wrestling continued its surprising and historic start to the season with a big time win over number 16 Pitt on Friday. It was the Terps' first ranked win since 2013. Braxton Brown, Ethan Miller, Michael North, Dominic Solis, and Jaron Smith all won their individual bouts. Brown started things off with a pin to put Maryland up 6-0 early. Miller claimed another decision for Maryland. Then North instituted a huge comeback over the 11th ranked wrestler in the nation. Solis added to the Terps lead, leaving it up to the 8th year senior, Jaron Smith, to clinch the victory. And he got it done. Final score, Maryland 18, Pitt 16. And now don't go anywhere because when we come back, we'll tell you about one student athlete at Maryland that has a very special relationship with a family member. And as always, we'll crown our Terp of the Week, Pro Terp, and Top 5 Plays. Stay with us. It's a dad. Every day is a challenge. To make sure that the time that I have, I spend with him. It doesn't matter how tired you are, you have to try and to teach them. When they learn something new and you can just see in their faces, it's, it's such an incredible moment. It's those moments that are, that are my favorite. Jason, let's go see your room. Well, welcome back once again to the left bench. Kev McNulty and Kira Bruno with you. And Kira, we've heard plenty of times about athletes having special bonds with family members that mean a lot to them. Well, that is certainly the case for one athlete here in College Park. Yep, definitely. And our Ben Wolf has more. Almost every day. Um, I try to put it in my schedule to talk to him and call him. While Allie Williams has a deep connection with volleyball, she has an even deeper connection off the court. That connection is with their 16-year-old brother, Brandon. Brandon was diagnosed with a rare disorder called chromosomal deletion syndrome at birth. Brandon is missing chromosome 4QT21, which doesn't allow him to talk or walk. Brandon's disability inspires Allie to be the best player she can be. I kind of play for him, so like whenever I'm thinking like, oh, I don't want to practice today, like I'm so tired, like just the fact that I can do this and he can't, like, he's always in the back of my mind 24-7, just knowing to work hard for him. And that one day, it's, like, all going to be worth it. 
With the entire Williams family being involved in the game of volleyball, Brandon loves being around the sport and watching his sister play. Anytime he gets like crabby or anxious, he likes to actually watch like one of our games. So we just like turn on one of me or my sister's games and then um, kind of calms him down. When Allie isn't playing volleyball, she loves to spend time with her brother. Anytime I'm home, we like go to Starbucks every single day. He likes their cake pops and I like to just to get coffee. So like anytime I'm home, like we usually go to Starbucks at least like five times a week. Despite being far from home in St. Louis, Missouri, with many of the Big Ten opponents being in the Midwest, Allie's parents and her brother get to see her play. A lot of our games are in the Midwest. They can come to a lot of the games. And then they usually like come a day early so that we can get dinner and like just hang out for a while. The love and support they share is truly at the core of what makes this young player so special. For Terrapin Sports Central, I'm Ben Wolf. Well, Kevin, it's great that Brandon still gets to see his sister play sometimes. Yeah, I mean, just an awesome story, and our thanks to Ben for telling it. And now our Terp of the Week is a player who just hit a milestone of 1,000 career points, and that's Dante Scott. In the new era of the Maryland men's basketball program, Scott has been taking on the role of the team's new leader, and he's certainly been living up to that title. Scott currently leads the team with 84, 84 points in his five games played and is averaging 16.8 points per, per game. In their tournament this past weekend, Scott tallied 25 points against St. Louis and 24 against Miami. Congrats to Dante on being crowned our Terp of the Week, and we're looking forward to seeing what else you bring this season. And it may come as a surprise, but this week's Pro Terp isn't actually an athlete. It's a very familiar face on this show, former TLB executive producer Katie Marr. Katie has been absolutely crushing it as a sports anchor and reporter at WIBW in Topeka, Kansas for the past six months. She's been having a blast covering Kansas and Kansas State football, as well as the Kansas City Chiefs. Yeah, a pretty successful franchise. We are so proud of Katie for making our organization so proud out there in the Sunflower State. There she is with another former executive producer, Noah Gross. Yeah. And here she is. I made the trip for Thanksgiving. I'm so glad you did. It's so <laughs> great to see you. You've been doing amazing things out in Kansas. You look so natural up there, as always. Oh, well, I'm just so impressed with everything that you guys have been doing. I see all the Terrapin Sports Central stuff on Twitter every day of every week, and I'm just, I feel like a proud grandma. I'm old, <laughs> Man, but. You, you better be impressed. But I'm this very, is weird we're working hard. My former co-anchor and now my current co-anchor. Yeah. We're all up here together. Yeah. <laughs> Happy it? little family. Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there's just one thing left to do in this show. That's top five plays. For old time's sake, Katie, you ready? Let's do it, All right, Kevin. give them number five. We are going to start number five. It's going to be Niklas Neumann with not one, but two saves versus Cornell in the second round of the NCAA tournament. Let's watch that again in slow-mo. That is awesome stuff from the keeper. Talented player right there. Now up to Connecticut where Juju Reese gets the slam against Miami. He has been one of the bright spots for Maryland so far this season. Not necessarily a surprise, but he's playing darn well. I've definitely loved seeing him go off this season. Now to number three, it's Jay Sean Jones with a touchdown catch against number two, Ohio State. That was a big moment. I was watching that on my phone this past Saturday covering another football game. Huge play right there from Jones. Now it's Malcolm Johnston with the back heel flick against Fairleigh Dickinson. Look at that pass to Albie and in for his first career goal. What a play. And now for your number one play of the week, it's C.J. Dupree with a massive hurdle against Ohio State on Saturday. How do you get that far? That's insane. I mean, he talked about he used to do that in high school. Yeah. And, you know, he, he brought it back this weekend against, you know, maybe the best team in the country. Yep. Yeah. Love to see it. Yeah. And, well, that's going to do it for this edition of The Left Bench. TLB In Focus will be back next week to recap Maryland football's regular season and preview its bowl matchup. And be sure to keep up with all of Terrapin Sports Central's coverage on Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube, and online at terrapinsportscentral.com. We'll see you next time.